Okay, good morning and welcome. It's great to see so many of you joining us this morning. I hope you all enjoyed the long weekend and got a nice break with your loved ones. Um, just before we kick into today's webinar, I have a small announcement, um, which is quite interesting, exciting news, I have to say. Um, so those of you who were with us last week might remember we got quite a lot of queries really across the sessions um, on the area of GDPR, data protection, and, and really what we can and can't do um, in these current times. And in, well, as I suppose, a fitting tribute to the spirit of these um, webinar series, um, I was contacted by one of our participants, Connor Hendley, who um, has kindly offered to facilitate, along with, um, with his colleague, John Popolizio, who founded um, with his wife, Ellie Sovi.com, um, and they are compliance experts. So they are going to um, give us a bonus webinar on Tuesday, the 21st of April. So further details will follow um, in your emails um, in relation to that webinar. So I do hope you can join us for this extra session. Um, and thank you, Connor, for uh, facilitating that and for reaching out with that opportunity. Um, so I really think that will be a, a very interesting one and something that's very relevant for many of our participants. So if you do have, and I know many of you have had over the last week, queries in relation to data protection, uh, privacy, compliance, and so on, please do send in your queries by email to myself or Michael, and we'll ensure we collate them and pass them on to John and Connor um, in putting that session together for you. Okay, so on to this morning's event. Our seminar today is on optimizing your supply chain and operations um, for smarter business. And we've got a really great lineup this morning. So we have Donald Daly, who's gonna MC. Donal is an author and founder of Six Rockets Consultancy, and he's also the chairman of Altify. We've also got Ingrid de Donker, who is CEO of IDEA, founder of the Procurement Transformation Institute, and a lecturer um, in the Graduate Business School in Griffith College with myself and Michael. We're also joined by Brian O'Kane, who is owner of Oak Tree Press, and Shirley Kelly, who is a strategic sourcing consultant. So a really, really busy schedule. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass you over to Donal, who will get us started um, and, and bring us through today's webinar. Thank you very much, Donal. Good morning, Eilish. Actually, we're going to have uh, Ingrid, um, who's going to give us a few words at the start, she being the font of all knowledge on procurement items. And um, so if, Ingrid comes and joins us. We should be good. I'm going to. Um, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you very much for um, your attendance. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And we're all delighted, even though we realize it's, it's a very tough time for everybody. Um, we're here though and we're trying to look forward and i'm delighted in this webinar to be sharing our experience that we have had in in idea ourselves in managing procurement and supply chain challenges but um i'm really looking forward to the input of my two distinguished guests who will share their broader business experience as they have lived and worked through some difficult times in the past so We'd be hoping you will all find some golden nuggets that you can take back into your business um, and that is of real value to you. So if I may first um, uh, introduce my panel of experts, uh, I'm absolutely delighted that they can join us. Um, they all have their unique own business um, expertise and perspective and I know they'll be sharing their learnings with you the good, the bad, and the ugly. So welcome, Dono, welcome, Shirley, and Brian. So Brian, just a quick word about you. I was so grateful that you answered my call to share your advice with, your, with our audience today because your expertise and your focus has always been centered around SMEs, innovation, entrepreneurship and business planning and I honestly believe you have the most rounded background of us all in, in practice and in, in academic teachings and you've always supported the startup community so with that you're an award-winning editor, publisher, trainer, mentor and again I couldn't find anyone more knowledgeable and eloquent to have part of the panel so thank you for joining us. 
Um, I also want to welcome a colleague of mine, Shirley Kelly. Um, she's been very active amongst other things, but since the uh, announcement of Brexit, Shirley has been on the road and traveled to the breadth and the depth of the country to meet um, a lot of different SMEs like yourselves. And I suppose on behalf of Enterprise Ireland, she supported many SMEs to understand um, their business um, challenges that they had from a supply chain point of view, offered them practice practical advice to identify the risk and, and how they could work together to mitigate, uh, put some mitigating plans in place. And only last week, she gave a great interview in relation to the coronavirus as well, and what SMEs can do right now to try and protect and secure and redirect their business. So I'm delighted she could join us today as well. I'm sure she will, she will share her um, golden nuggets with you as well. And then finally, last but not least, RMC, Donald Daly. I've known Donald for a good few years. Uh, when I met uh, Donald first, he was CEO of his fifth company, um, Altify. It was a global software uh, business employing hundreds of people. His sixth company now is called Six Rockets. And I wonder why Donald, obviously, um, because it's your sixth company and you're, you're only reaching for the, for the stars. Um, I just wanted you to have you on the panel and being MC because not only you have a specific knowledge around procurement and supply chain, but you're, you, you have an invaluable and practical expertise and experience of managing SMEs through disruptive times. So for people who don't know, as you like to stay in the background, you're an author of a bunch of books, as you would say, but you also are an author of uh, several Amazon bestsellers in the space of digital transformation. You've worked with most of the Fortune 100 companies in the States, and you have launched quite powerful products um, in the field of digital uh, transformation. So, but we're not going to talk about that today. I'm excited just to have your viewpoint shared with the audience about your CEO days. And um, maybe first let's go through the agenda and see what we're going to cover today. Um, so we're going to, uh, I'll give the word back to you, Donald, and you're going to tell us about the seven lessons learned uh, from a CEO point of view. I'll then focus a little bit more about um, how we can, in disruptive time, try to optimize our supply chain. Uh, Shirley will bring us further online with her practical things to do for SMEs and Brian will enlighten us with adjusting to the new normal and um, in disruptive times, we can also see opportunities. And that will just leave you with some parting thoughts. So without further ado, I think, and to open up the session, Donald, can you take us on the journey of some of your businesses and can you give us your, your key learnings of how you managed uh, through some tough times in the past? I can, Ingrid, thanks. The, um... Uh, you have said, and others have said, I've never really had a proper job. Um, I've, uh, I started my first company in 1986, um, where clearly I was two, right? But it's, it's so, um, but uh, yeah, we first met, um, I was CEO of Altify, which um, I'm happy to say we, we, we sold last October. Uh, and I, I'm not in that business anymore of it. Um, so it was, it's interesting kind of thinking about this, 1986, I started my first business, we had the crash in 87. I started my second business in 99, we had the dot-com thing in 2000, and then we had 2011. Um, I had a couple of other businesses, and then in 2005, I started Altify, um, and then we had the crash in 2008. Um, and um, uh, they've all been interesting, and they've all been tough. None, I would say, as difficult as the situation that people are facing right now. Um, but I think the, what, what I've also kind of seen and noticed over the years from my perspective is, um, the, and, uh, is the resilience of owners and founders and entrepreneurs and people who, who, who kind of get about what they do. So, so the knowledge that I have, as you know, about procurement and supply chain is, 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 is limited and it comes from my, my, my experience. And along the way, I've definitely made my share of mistakes. Um, but one of the benefits of getting older, I guess, is, is you, you, you tend to become more receptive to other people's wisdom and more reflective on, on, on input. And when I was a, a young buck in, 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 in my first companies and people would have different opinions than mine, I mightn't necessarily have been that 
uh, reflective or reasonable in, 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 in response. But along the way, I've definitely learned a lot from people who've been kind enough to spend their time uh, and to kind of give, give, give me guidance. Um, and the experience that you gain through, through, through all that kind of stuff is, I think, looking back now is, is, um, is invaluable. So um, I suppose taking from my experiences over the years through the different companies, I want to kind of share those thoughts and if people get something from it, that's good. So I'm first, they feel privileged and honored and to, to, to be here and thanks to Eilish and the Griffith team and Ismi for sponsoring and you for inviting. And hopefully, hopefully there'll be some, some value as we, uh, as we get through it. So I'm gonna give you seven lessons from my perspective as a CEO, they're mine based on things that I've screwed up many, many times in many ways and, and lessons I've learned. And, and the first thing I suppose starts with, um, uh, it's kind of simple. And in times like this, it might feel a little bit grand, but it's not, it's not meant to be. It's, it's when I think about, about, about vision, it's, it's kind of, I have to know when I get up every day, when I go to work and when people come to work and when I meet my customers, what's the purpose of what I'm doing? And I've found in tough times, um, and I remember I speaking to someone yesterday, I remember November 4th in 2008, we had the crash and I had, uh, at that stage, we were in Alta 5, we probably had a bit over 100 people in the business and we had to cut a number of people, we had to cut some costs, we had to do this. But when we explained once more what the vision of the business was, which at that time, Alta 5 was a software company that helped salespeople be more effective. But, um, um, when we could talk about with honest and truth and overt transparency, uh, the things that we were trying to achieve and the vision of the business. And at that point in time, the vision of the restructure that we had to make, um, then while it was tough for everybody, um, having a clear picture of the end state, what we were trying to do and why we were doing it uh, was really important. So, in, in, in other times, I would talk about, uh, in other times less challenging than this one, I would talk about people saying, when you're building a business, why are you doing it? What is the, what is the importance of what you're doing? What is the urgent problem you're trying to solve for your customer? Um, and cause as a CEO, you get up every day and you have this wonderful opportunity to make a decision that screws up your business, right? So that's one of the beautiful things of, of being a, a, a CEO, but you also have the opportunity to, be really clear on your business and keep people on the journey. So kind of first step, the first, the first thought, first lesson I've learned is if we can be clear as to where we're heading and particularly in tough times, then it helps people uh, go on the journey. The second kind of point I'd like to make is, is and people have said this to me a number of times, I've started now six businesses. Uh, I'm a workaholic I, or, or I'm a startaholic or I'm a, I'm a, I'm a something. Uh, but it's what I do and I like building things. But at the same time, when if someone says to me, so why did you start your business or should I start a business? And, and, and um, I always like to ask people the question, so what happens if you don't do it, right? Because when you think about and everyone on this call who runs a business or who runs a, a significant division within, a, within a, 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 a company or runs a project or starting something new today, when you start on the journey, it should be a journey you're trying to complete, right? And that means that as an, as an owner or an entrepreneur, and you know this, Ingrid, and, and, and I know I've dealt with Brian Money, he knows this, it's not something you can start and stop. It's much easier to start a business than stop it, right? So when you do it and you have customers, and you have employees, you have people whose mortgages depend on you turning up every day, you have to do it for something that you believe in deeply, care about with some passion, and you need to be able to, you need to be prepared to go to extraordinary lengths to make that happen. Now, when you're faced with situations like this, um, you think about your business, but you think about your customers and you think about your employees. And many, I've spoken to many entrepreneurs and business owners over the last kind of few weeks, and they're going, I need to figure out what I do because there's a lot of people dependent on me, my customers and my uh, employees. So the commitment that you make in your business and the commitment that you make today to the next stage of your business, because I think Brian's gonna talk about this later, it's not gonna be the same, right? So you're making a conscious decision to say, 
I'm not going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to take some actions and make some decisions to, uh, to live in this new normal world that, that, that we're going to have. So commitment is important and we make that conscious decision every day to do it. The other thing that's kind of interesting right now is because things are changing, right? It's, it's, we need to kind of think about what it is that we need to do that's going to be different, right? And in, in, in the normal world, uh, it can be difficult to get the, 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 the balance right between investing in today's business and tomorrow's vision. Um, because when you speak to your customer, if a customer has an issue, they understand the problem they have today. And if a customer complains to you, they will complain to you about the problem they have today. They won't complain to you about the vision that you haven't shared with them yet, right? Because they have enough problems today and you need to worry about the problems that they have tomorrow. So it's important to remember as you think about it, right? Because everything is changing. Every one of us is, um, you know, not all, not all consumers are business people, but all business people are consumers. So we need to kind of think about this, that the customer can tell you what they don't like today, but most customers can't tell you what they will need from you tomorrow. And particularly in a world where tomorrow is changing, um, it's your responsibility to kind of see the future, which is really tough, right? So, so uh, we need to think about that. So innovation belongs to you and you owe it to your customer. Um, one of the things I know I've been guilty of this many times, right? One of the things that I find is when people uh, speak or ask a question or sitting across the table from you, you know, and you say something, sometimes you're listening to respond as opposed to listen to understand. So when someone says something, it's really important to A, give them the respect to, and, and that, that, that you can value what they say, but understand that you're listening to understand because the more you understand, the better you can serve. The better you can serve, the better business that you do. And whether that's in a relationship or whether it's with your employees or whether it's with your customers, it's like not just sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for your turn to speak, right? Right, if you're kind of one of those early jumpers that shows that you're not really interested in what the other person has to say, and that's both kind of disrespectful and it's ineffective. So a lesson I learned along the way is the more I could shut up and pause and reflect and wait for people to finish what they have to say and sometimes go, I don't understand and seek to understand, it's been really helpful. Whether I'm talking to my employees, whether I'm talking to my customers uh, or whether I'm talking to anyone else, if I can listen, and leave space, I've found it to be um, effective. And part of that feeds into the fact that, you know, often you kind of say, you know, and sometimes you're really annoyed at something and, and it's really annoying you. I don't understand why they did this, or I don't understand why she can't do this or whatever. I'd like to say to folks to focus on the bit that says, I don't understand. Right? Because it's when you don't understand, sometimes it's you that doesn't understand as opposed to the person not doing something and I recall with one of I've had a, 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 a software developer who worked with me since 1987 so through five different companies and and we're good buddies and oh I remember one stage going you know I just can't understand why they can't you know complaining about employees not in a in a behind their back complaining but just why can't anyone do whatever and he says to me, Donald, you know, from where you sit, it's always going to look different, right? Because I could make the decisions. I could decide to hire or fire or change direction or do those kind of things. And what we don't know always is that when someone is struggling, we don't know what they're struggling with, right? We know that each of these people, their mothers and fathers and wives and husbands and daughters and sons, and friends and partners, and they're trying to juggle different balls. And you don't know that you know, the person who didn't make their sales number, right, might also be someone who goes that extra mile for the customer sometimes, right? Or the, the, the person, the customer service person who turned up late this morning might be because they're at home taking care for their elderly parent. There are things going on in people's lives that we don't understand. And it's often useful to kind of go and say, 
I wonder, I wonder how things look like from their perspective. I think that's been, uh, that's been valuable. And in times of stress, like this is an incredible time of stress, and it's really difficult for folks right now, it takes incredible discipline and strength to kind of step back and say, hmm, I wonder what it looks like from their perspective, but, but I think it's valuable. Um, the second thing I would say, uh, the, the, the second last thing I would say is when people say, what do you care about most, right? I've always cared most about my employees because my employees are people who turned up every day to look after my customers. And if they looked after my customers, my customers by definition looked after my business. And it's that, it's that kind of simple, people matter and your employees are investing a huge part of their life in helping you succeed on your vision. So I think that's, that's, that's important. And then Ingrid, you won't be surprised to hear me say the last one here, which is learn for life, right? I think it's really important. I know when I started my first business, I absolutely knew nothing, right? I might still know little, or I, I know no less about more things. Maybe that's what's happened, right? But, but um, I, I suppose one thing I might've had going for me was I like to read and I like to read business books. And I wrote everything, I read everything at that time from, from people in my space, sort of like Kotler and Porter and Reese and Trout and Peters and Mark McCormick and all this. There's a guy called Robert Townsend who had a great uh, irreverent book called Up Your Organization, which was just fantastic. And I always found I really liked the books that I agreed with, you know, <laughs> but, 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 but you learn things along the way. So as you kind of step through it, I suppose the lessons that we learn that will probably hopefully inform what we do tomorrow dealing with this challenge that we currently have and what we do tomorrow and make decisions around our supply chain and make decisions around our customers making our, our our employees as you kind of think about vision commitment innovation listening perspective our employees and our knowledge if you nail all of them all of the time then you're exceptional right i know i've never nailed all of them all of the time i've hopefully nailed some of them some some of the time but anyone who can do these things will be formidable uh, supporters of their business going forward for their employees and their customers as they work through everything else. So there's some of the things I've learned, so some thoughts from an old guy, right, who's, who's, who's been through a few of these things and, and, and hopefully there's some value. So um, now I'm gonna bring us to the, the, the meat of the conversation and Ingrid, um, when you and I first met, which is, I don't know, four or five years ago. Yeah. And the people in the people on the call here who are involved ever in kind of selling something to large corporates or to large businesses or whatever would probably share a view. Some some will share a view that I shared when we first met, which is procurement strategic. Are you kidding me? Right? It was always procurement for the people who got on the way of the things I was trying to do when I was trying to build my business. And um but what I've actually learned, right, and, and, you know, it took me a long time and a lot of businesses to learn some of this, that actually, if you can buy well, then that's a good thing. And we all like to shop, right? But if, if you can buy well, then there's a lot of things we can do. And you and I have had conversations around this in terms of how it impacts whether I buy things that are good for the environment, whether they impact buy things that, that can save me money, whether I buy things or understand this kind of stuff. So that's everything I know about procurement right there. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you. Um, but for the folks who've not got into it before, I'm going, listen up. She's going to give you pearls. It's, it's, it's really good. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Tono. Um, I, I, I definitely, there's, there's some cool nuggets in there. And, and, and the two that absolutely stand out for me is perspective, especially coronavirus it's what we need to do now we need to look back and we need to look forward and the lifelong learning we can't as as you know we just we just never can know enough and before we start um i just wanted to let our audience know that procurement is also all about customers it sometimes feels that procurement or or the people who buy in your company um are far removed from the sales side or the customers. And it's, it's further than the truth, um, because if we do not buy the right products or services, our businesses cannot sell it on, they cannot add value to the production, or that they cannot make profit on the sold goods. 
for us as buyers, as uh, people who select suppliers, our five rights are all about delivering for the customers because ultimately it's about buying and enabling the right product um, at the right price, at the right time, with the right quali quality and at the right place. So we ultimately are um, focusing on delivering for the customer. And it's not only the customer that buys our product, it's also our internal customers, our stakeholders, we buy products for. Um, anyone who wants to buy something for the business is in essence our customer. So we're actually a, a, a customer service support. However, we, 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 we think we're doing a little bit more. So what does procurement and supply chain actually mean in the business sense? Well, procurement, um, because it, it, it's, it's such a, um, a word that combines a lot of things. It refers to the processes of selecting suppliers, um, establishing payment terms, vetting strategically who your uh, core supplier can be, negotiating contracts, and actually the, the, the buying of goods, making them available to your business. So we're concerned about acquiring the goods and services and work that is vital to the business. And the majority of the time, between 50 and 70% of any turnover of an organization is spent with outsourced uh, providers, with third-party providers. So it's good to have um, a good grasp on that. Not all businesses, we realize, have dedicated buyers, but all businesses buy goods and services. And if you think of your own business, your procurement is done by anyone who spends money on behalf of your business. If you want to know what money you spend, you can, you can actually just go and look and review your P&L account, your profit and loss account, and, and, or your accountant will be able to tell you what you have spent and, and they kind of categorize it in, in your spend uh, data. It's a good place to start to understand what you spend and who you spend it with, when and why. Supply chain, on the other hand, means a network between your company, your business, and its suppliers to produce and distribute a specific product to the, to the final customer. Um, this network, network includes different activities, people, entities, information, resources, and the supply chain itself, and I will um, always come back to the, the chain of supply, it represents the different steps it takes to get the product from its original state from, uh, to the customer. So from farm to fork, basically. Companies develop their supply chain so they can actually reduce costs, remain competitive in a business landscape. Managing supply chain then becomes a very important part of that business um, success. And there are many different links in the chain that require a lot of skill and expertise. And when supply chain management is effective, it can lower a company's overall cost and boost its profitability. It can make sure that it can make the right decision. But if one link in the chain breaks down, it can affect the rest of the chain and it can be very costly and it might even impact your business. It will definitely impact your customer satisfaction, their cost and their experience. So the main goal of an efficient supply chain is actually to get the customers what they want, when they want it and at the lowest cost. If a company fails to focus on its customer, it will fail to survive. So good procurement is all about customers. And I just wanted to open up with that because sometimes we, we, we get the um, criticism that we have no idea what the customer wants. Um, but for this session, I want us to focus what we can do to optimize the supply chain in difficult times because if a supply chain fails, so will the company. The company will fail if we don't get uh, the products and the services. And unfortunately, we need a, an uh, a pandemic to remind us that creating and managing a resilient supply chain is actually a strategic function. Um, as I already said, on average, 50 to 70% of the turnover of any business is spent with somebody else outside external um, uh, uh, with, with third party providers. And we depend on buyers, supply chain professionals to spend that money wisely, recommend, recommend the best commercial decision, negotiate the best value for money, 
and try to mitigate the risk. Nobody wants to buy risk. We want to mitigate risk. I repeat, a supply chain, if a supply chain fails, so will a, so will a business fail as well. So it, it's a truism for all sizes of businesses, any industry, any sector. The strategic thing to do then is focusing on doing the right things and doing it right, making the right buying decisions. And like Donald said, we like to do that with the triple bottom line of your business at heart, making the right decisions for your profit. It needs to be a sustainable business, making the right um, decision for your own people, but also the people, your customers, and uh, uh, making sure there is social inclusion uh, in your decision. And finally, making the right decision for the planet. Uh, we need to make sure we have that triple bottom line squared off in any buying decision we make. Otherwise, we're just going to harm one of the three key components in, um, in our business. So again, procurement is a strategic function, supply chain is a strategic function, and it's true for all sizes of the business. It doesn't matter how big, how small, and what industry. So from a, what can we control? The flow of information we can control. Working in any procurement or supply chain management role, it can be all consuming and it can be quite challenging. We just don't live in a vacuum. And we're no doubt an important link in, in any supply chain, but it's only one link in an end-to-end -end process of farm to fork, getting the product or the service moved from the supplier to the end user. And in the simplest type of supply chain, products and services are sourced and converted um, from products into uh, the, and, and delivered to the end, end customer. During this process, we see there's a flow of products, uh, information, and finances, and it moves from uh, left to right. It moves forward through the supply chain. But in the same way, we deal as well with products, money, and related information flowing back from the supply chain. And on a slide, it looks very simple, but it actually isn't. We wish it was a, a lot less complex. Because any supply chain involves interaction between people, between informations, companies or entities, physical resources that combine hopefully harmoniously to sustain a company's competitiveness. It also has an objective to reduce the overall cost and speed um, of the production and distribution cycle. So we are dealing with a lot of internal targets and, and, and the business manages our performance against different um, targets, such as inventory turns or lowest cost. Um, as a supply chain professional knows very well, if a supplier is unable to supply on time, within budget, the business uh, will take the, the losses and will also um, create a negative reputation opposite its customers. So your own business is part of this overall chain. I don't know where you sit. You might sit at the front end, you might be a manufacturer, you might sit at the back end. So you might actually be very close to your end users. Just know there's multiple businesses going before you and there's probably a few businesses behind you if you, you're not delivering to your end. Um, user. We're all customers and we're all suppliers in our own right. And under normal trading circumstances, this is the flow we can control. Unfortunately, um, we, already, we already know that um, these are not normal circumstances. Even in a normal, when you, when you have a perfect business running, there are still things that are outside of your control. There are multiple disruptors outside of, of your own business that you actually don't have a handle on and you're a taker of that information, you're a taker of that um, uh, impact. So for example, the market itself, your market, the current markets can be contracting, expanding. Your customers can come and go. New markets can be opening up. That is outside of your control. There are opportunities, but you are to react. 
you it's very hard to uh, be be uh, proacting there your own industry can be a disruptor there's lots of competition in your own industry the products and services they might be interchangeable there might be new products coming online improved projects products that can replace the cost might be volatile we, we uh, the majority of our costs are 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 uh, or the commodities are traded on, on global uh, markets. And we're takers of that information. New businesses can be entering into the market. New alliances or monopolies can be formed. Multiple disruptors. And then ultimately, we also have the global ecosystem. The political changes, economical, societal, technological, legal and environmental. We would call that PESTO. That's the abbreviation for it. But for example, Brexit would have been a perfect example how an otherwise very stable political uh, environment has reaped havoc over the last few years. So we need to consider all these disruptors and also other factors that are impacting our ability to control. Supply chain from start to finish is a very complex network across the globe. We have learned that between 35 and 50% of the majority of the products are being sourced out of um, China, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Asia. So it's not close to home. The supply chain is a dynamic system and is always and ever changing. Systems variations over time become very important considerations and we need to learn from that. The speed of change has dramatically increased and it's a real concern to the market, to the demands, to innovation. Uh, something that, has, that is new today is already old tomorrow. Interdependencies in this network are not always understood because they're all um, interlinked. And ultimately, we're still dealing with people behind it all and they are the biggest source of variation. So coming back to the coronavirus, it has disrupted supply, supply chains across the world. And it has hit across all the links in the chains and across all the segments of the ecosystem. It, it, it has taken away our, our foundation and our building blocks. And with that, it has created also a bullwhip effect across our whole society. That little pebble in the lake has created a tsunami of disruption. You are one of those links in the whole supply chain and you are feeling the might of the disruption. It all depends where in the link you sit and how well prepared you are and how well prepared your other links are. And this is where I would um, uh, talk a little bit further later. But first I want to make you understand how did we let it get this far? Why are we in the situation? Because God, we're, we think we're smart people. We think we're smart business people and we got everything under control. Ultimately, uh, a lot of businesses have not been prepared to deal with this um, uh, pandemic. And there's two words really. And the first one is the globalization, supply chain uh, globalization. Um, it has become a major unintended consequence of, um, of the, uh, the, the pandemic that we are now. So the globalization of all our supply chain is, is, um, is showing that we, our production is further and further removed. Um, and it has been a trend over the last uh, few decades. It has moved the demand um, of our customers have asked us to move further and further away for even lower costs um, and therefore we move to low cost geographies 20 30 years ago this is not you know just five years ago this has been happening for the last so many years um, so these extended factories that we've been managing from uh, from here from america across the world they're further away and therefore there's less control the modern economy runs on these interconnected global supply chain, but with distance and complexity have come new types of risks. And this has greatly increased the potential touch points of the supply chain weakness. It has 
put some stress on some of the links and it has uncovered some of the weaknesses. The low cost geographies are not next, not next door. The distance itself has added layers of complexity. And with that, we have actually allowed a lack of transparency transparency to happen, transparency in that information, transparency in the financial movement and transparency in the source. Globalization is a fact of life and expansion opportunities are well known. It's the creation of a single global economy and community and, and there's, there's great benefits out of it. However, we have overlooked a lot of the risks and we haven't developed them proactively to make sure that the organizations can make the best decisions for the growth of their business and for the sustainability of the customer's delivery. Black spawn events like these, and the majority will happen through infrastructural disruption, pandemic disasters like we're seeing, security, virtual security uh, threats. All of these show up the type and the severity of the risks faced by companies and, and, and these risks are changing. And it's very hard to say on top of all those changing risks and um, leading organizations have developed and are developing and applying an armor of new tools and techniques to manage these, but it's very hard to stay on top of a changing market, a changing industry, changing ecosystem and changing customer demand. Um, unfortunately, coronavirus is going to be the best case study in practice that, um, that will be used to stress test business continuity plans. And it's unfortunate that we have to learn that the majority of companies have not been prepared and had no real contingency plan for this worst case scenario. The second trend on top of globalization that ha actually has, has brought us here has to do with the lean production and the just-in-time delivery. And it, that has all to do with cost and reducing waste. Lean means creating more value for customers with fewer resources. And the ultimate goal of lean is to eliminate waste as much as we can, providing perfect value to the customer through a perfect value creation process that has no waste. Um, in supply chain, there's about eight wastes and eight categories of waste and I've outlined them here. Um, we're not going to go through them, but you will see that stock, motion, transport and overproduction would have all had stock um, related to them in the past. Here they're considered as waste. This is where most of the business would have buffered up stock to smoothen out the process or to react to additional demand when you are working in a lean environment, and, and again, this, this um, comes back from the Toyota philosophy, when you're working in a lean environment, all of that is streamlined as much as possible. Just a little bit on just in time, it actually means simply put, not too late, not too early, just in time, which actually then means we have no inventory, we have no lead time, we have no delay and we have no failures. These are great goals for production to have for a manufacturing side. And these are, again, KPIs that uh, business are being um, targeted and, and performance managed towards. It's great if and when you have enough supply and you have a stable um, chain. However, if you don't, a lean supply chain will have increased their um, vulnerability short product life cycles and the desire to conserve working capital encourages companies to keep inventories and buffer stocks really, really low. Just in time is great when everything runs smooth. If not, it shows immediately the weakness in the chain. We have an extended chain of communication that also has breakages across the chain. Think around cultural communication, miscommunication, we communicate errors throughout an extended chain. If you only think back on the, the Chinese whispers um, exercise you used to do as a child, uh, it, it, the same happens in an extended chain of communication. So the combination of globalization and lean production means that we have very little stock build up in our full supply chain. And that is why when Corona hit, when it started, 
it exposed all the weaknesses, it exposed shortages, which um, with very little backup and very little reaction time. So if I think back before the coronavirus, and again, this is only two months ago, um, you were very busy. This, might, this slide might be a good representation of you and your business. Very busy as, as Frank there managing all the demand and supply to ensure his customers stayed happy or trying to understand the impact of Brexit on your business, such as, as Bill, uh, trying to mitigate the risk of logistics and products and services coming from or through the UK um, with alternative supply options. Or like the others, keeping very busy, growing your, busy, your business, increasing your profit by cutting down your cost, increasing your uh, uh, customer base, and trying to get through with the help of some great advice, as well as, um, as with the, the help of our friends, as we do from time to time. So thinking back to those times now, it all feels a bit weird because, and Brian will talk about it, we won't go back to normal. We will have a new normal. And, you know, not, not thinking through that, um, not accepting that will actually delay our reactive approach to what the business can be um, in the next few months. So we're all a little bit um, dazed. Um, we understand we're at a... Um, position in the link and uh, it might be at the start, it might be at the finish. finish. Um, we're confused at best. Um, we're like ships in the night. We, we don't actually have a compass like Donald is saying, what is my vision? Where am I going to go? How, how am I going to lead my team to, to the next, um, to the uh, how can I lead my team to grow in my business if my market is gone, if my customers are gone? if my um, suppliers are gone, um, it's hard to see the safe harbor. And, and the level of readiness um, is, uh, is, is very low uh, across the world. So we've seen various risks that have hit business simultaneously. So global dis difficulties in securing supply of goods and services and across borders, we only have to think back on PPE. Higher cost, reduced services, um, rapidly changing global reactions of big organization that, again, have that bullwhip effect across the world. National le uh, legislation and European regulation and, and response plans. The unavailability of your workforce because it's not allowed. There's so many, again, complexity of risk that are enhanced by non-concerted reaction of few that impact so many. And the reality of the challenges facing us, we've never seen before. Uh, uh, and I was just thinking, there's some, a few movies I can think of that um, um, I have seen in the past that might have been kind of these doom day scenarios, but um, we're not going to focus on that. We want to focus on what can we do? We, we know where we are, or we don't know where we are. We need to find out where we are, but what can we do from here? For us, it's always around work together. You need to get together with your key suppliers. You need to get together with your core customers, and you need to try to identify the common risk and challenges you have, because you're all in this together. You're only as good as your weakest link. Find your weakest link and strengthen it together working together to understand the alternatives. Look at the different criteria, look at your costs, look at the risks, look at the benefits of the alternatives, and then try to map it out. Try to map it out and rank them according to the ease of your implementation and the complexity of the change. Think of it as a big puzzle. And if I think of a big puzzle, one of these, it, it brings me back to one of my uncles who was trying for years to complete a huge puzzle in the good room of my, my grandmother. Like there were like thousand pieces to that puzzle. But ultimately, when you put a puzzle together, you have to see the bigger picture. So what's your bigger picture? Can you see the individual pieces as well? Can you put them together? And, and if not, what is missing? Those are very basic questions, but 
they're all very relevant to your business. I know that the different pieces that are missing will be different for different sectors, different businesses, retail, manufacturing. We all have specific characteristics, especially from a supply chain point of view. But ultimately, we're here about managing change and we're here about managing the risks. So I'm just going through the next uh, few steps that um, from a supply chain point of view, I would advise to do. First things first, so many things are hidden. We need to first uncover and make visible what is hidden. So for any company seeking to um, um, improve uh, the understanding of their risk is to make visible what is hidden. Uh, use all your available data. Collect your own data from your, from, from your own uh, buying team or your own uh, financial data, your customers, your inventory, your logistic, your manufacturers, as far back as you can and as far forward in your supply chain as you can. Hone in on those specific and relevant risks and try to unhide them across your team. Collaborate internally and externally and find as much as you can in your contracts, around your lead times, around supplier agreements, specification, data, anything you can find to actually map your, your puzzle together. Ask yourself some questions. Do not, I know my core suppliers? Do I know my core products and services? And all the links um, uh, in that supply chain. And that is very important because if you don't know who your current core critical suppliers are, you might be focusing your limited time on the wrong suppliers. You need to focus where it matters. Have you mapped your end-to-end -end supply chain with the suppliers that really matter for your business? Again, most of the time you will know your first tier supplier, sometimes your second tier supplier but most of the time there's four or five and multiple tiers to that whole supply chain. If you ask your first uh, tier supplier that information and they do the same, ultimately we'll get the full map. And the ones that care about your business, they will work with you. They, the, the strategic critical suppliers, same for your customers. They will work with you and they will, um, open up and hide that information. Have you actually asked your suppliers if they have a continuity plan themselves? Have you asked them what they have put in place either before the coronavirus happened or since? Good to know what they have done might be very, very applicable to you. And are you sharing with them? Are you sharing what you're doing with your customers, with your suppliers? Um, because again, it is important that you strengthen that link. You pull them closer together and you hold on tight. By asking the right questions, you will get a lot closer to the visibility of your own supply chain from start to finish. The more data, the better. And once you have your data, then actually it's about what are the different scenarios? What is it? Is it increased costs I need to deal with? Is it an acceptable quality? Is it delays that I need to um, offset? Do I need to deal with errors, bad services, no product at all? So what are your what ifs and worst case scenarios? Use your data that you know and make it usable by linking it through these different scenarios. Think forward what you can advise yourself to do now because ultimately you can turn what you know now into very valuable information for yourself and your supply um, um, friends, your team, but you can use it actually to create a, a bigger insight. And out of visibility comes predictability. You will begin to understand where your business is most at risk and you can start making a, 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 a plan around different scenarios and understand the sensitivities around different risks. You have um, different agents of data uh, that can help you here. And it's all about um, scenario planning the different, um, the different risks. 
If your critical suppliers are failing, you will need to put a plan in place to source new ones. Otherwise, your business um, will go down under with them. If your critical products or services are delayed or not even produced anymore, you will have to review either your demand, your specification, you will have to go and find alternatives that will be acceptable to your customers. You can ask your customers what is acceptable. Stay close to your customers. Make sure they know, they understand you're doing whatever you can to serve them, to keep on serving them. But you go through these different options and you can assess the costs, the risk, the specification, the implication, the time implications to make the different scenarios happen. Try to visualize that new puzzle and try to understand what the new pieces are that you might be able to put in place. Ultimately, it, it's all about mapping it then and um, putting a plan in place. This here now, the risk and contingency mapping, and again, you will see um, from stakeholder to stakeholder to stakeholder, it's going back and it's going forward. Ultimately, it's about putting your action plan in place and map your way back to success. Based on your real data, with a considered approach by ranking the different risks by priority and by understanding when you're going to do what. You've put an action plan in place to mitigate the risks that you have uncovered in your supply chain and you are ready to implement it when a trigger point has been reached. And ultimately, there's always options. Your aim is to step through all of this and put your plan in place. Um, make sure you get all that information. Make sure your plan is also shared with others outside your business. And we're talking about the real clear communication uh, and, and, and real collaboration. It's vital that com co uh, companies communicate um, with, their, with their supplier before and their customer after, but further their second supplier as well. Again, your supplier is a customer of his supplier and you're a supplier to your customers. We're all in the same boat. Don't forget, close relationships and times of needs are worth gold. And if you've read any bit about the phone calls that Bono and the extended team has made to get valuable PPE last week into Ireland, it was because of relationships. It was because of influence. It was because of goodwill. You build that up over time. You build that with good communication and relationship because ultimately people buy from people and people sell to people. Not more than now and in an disruptive environment, this is more truthful. It was not money that talked. It was relationship that made that PPE come on the plane over to Ireland. So make strong business plans part of your future business foundation understand your business and the different building blocks it is built on protect them but ensure you have a plan b and even a plan c because ultimately we might have to invoke them um, if you want to know a, a, a you know if you want to start somewhere and you want to start with a with an iso standard because sometimes they are very valuable to 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 show us the way the ISO 22301 is a risk management standard. It's a good place to start if you want to structure your own contingency plan and there's lots of um, information available online. Right. Once you have your plan done, you're going to prioritize because you need to prioritize the implementation. You can't focus on everything. You need to focus your actions where it matters. Not every supplier will pose an equal risk to your business. Um, so what we would do, what we would call, we, we, we'd use CrowdCheck Matrix. And I know, um, again, uh, I live by CrowdCheck, but ultimately what it means is you actually segment your suppliers. You segment your suppliers, their products and services on the scale of which one are the most valuable to us, i.e. which ones are we spending the most money with, and also which one are the most risky if they would close down tomorrow, how would they impact my business? This way, 
you can focus your attention to secure the supply of the products and services from the suppliers that are very impactful. This way you can focus on uh, tightening that relationship you have with those suppliers so that you become their partner of choice. The 80-20 rule applies. So again, prioritize your, your, your uh, implementation. Uh, you focus first on the most urgent and most important things to do. And then you will be able to go through your slide. While you address the most urgent ones, the others will come into view and slowly but surely you will make your chain stronger, a lot stronger than it was before. You will actually now take ownership of your full supply chain and bring it under control, what can be otherwise damaging to your business. If you remember back on our slide of what we can control, well, that's what we need to be able to control. Um, and that's what you do with um, prior, priority planning, because ultimately we're still trying to ensure we get the customer, our customer, what he wants, when he wants it, at the lowest cost possible. And by now you should know that you're the most important link in the full supply chain, but you're only the strong, as strong as your weakest link. And 10 brains think better than one. I've learned that it's one of my lessons. Asking for help is, is, a, is a strength, it's not a weakness. Um, the same applies to strengthening your supply chain. So do it together. Ensure that um, you have more than one supplier for your key products or services you buy in. You cannot depend uh, the continuance of your business on one supplier that might go under. It's your responsibility. You're the business owner. Through collaboration with the core suppliers in your network, your buyers, your supply chain, you can directly strengthen the business the relationship and mitigate risks together, resolve those problems together. The best companies configure their whole entire supply chain to promote resilience and resilience is what we need to grow our business. Own your, own your piece of your chain, own your link. Um, and most of the time we can do that together. Most of the time we should do that together. Your business will depend on it in good times and in bad times. Um, and to just wrap up, because I know, and Eilish knows this, I can talk for eight hours about supply chain and procurements and longer, but I want to just leave you with a little supply visibility mapping tool that you can use to actually share that with your suppliers and so that they can share it with their suppliers. It's a very basic tool that, is just asking questions. But these are valuable questions that you can make visible to your um, suppliers. Communicate clearly as your first point of call with your first year suppliers. And they all, they might be agents, they might be distributors, wholesalers, manufacturers. They might not all know the answer. Ask them to go and find the right answer. They should do the same for their own business. Make it a very strong communication chain to create a true picture of your risk to the business, but also your opportunity to the business. Your suppliers will value this. Your customers will value this. Um, and your suppliers, they should know you, you, you care. And they also should, should care because you're their supplier, you're their customer of choice. And if they don't, I actually would argue they do not deserve to be your supplier. So um, share it with them. Um, ask them the right questions and, and ask them to do it further so that you have a full list and see where your risks are that you can focus on to write a plan around, already source some, some other suppliers, some other products to make sure you can still deliver to your customers. So I hope I've given you some insight of what I would recommend you to do to make your supply chain more resilient. So, but I'm happy to take any questions later if that's okay. Um, Donald, I don't know. Have you fallen asleep? Thank you. I have not fallen asleep. I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I'm depressed, scared, oh. or excited, right? So I think it's across the spectrum. I think one of the, one of the when, you, when you think about what we've all seen happen, you know, and you kind of go, well, that comes from China. Well, it doesn't anymore, right? Or that comes from, as, as you said, you said, 
towards like the cheap source of supply isn't near, right? Mm. Different more than that. Um, but I think that on the one hand, at least what I've learned is, is the supply chain being complex, which mm. we all took for granted, right? We didn't, yeah. We didn't think about the fact that the, the uh, Apple PC that lands on our desk actually started a life in China or wherever. Right. Or the little TPS that goes into the little phone oh, has gone around three three times around the world. Exactly. Right. So 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 that complexity is globally a little bit scary, right? And we're seeing the impact of it. Um, I think though on the other side of it, then when I take because I always kind of go to what's the worst case can happen, and then you can try and figure out what are the bits that that that, that you can fix and you can control. Uh, visibility is clearly really important, and the devil is in the detail. Always, yeah. Um, but I think you referenced, we don't have a safe harbor, but I remember a friend of mine used to say, you know, when a ship misses a harbor, it's rarely the harbor's fault. <laughs> we all kind of get to control how we navigate. Yeah. Um, so, so we're going to move on from that. And uh, if we can bring Shirley in. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Um, thank you. And if people have questions, by the way, uh, you can put questions into the Q&A thing and we can deal with that at the end. Um, there's a lot that's kind of gone through that. And, and when, I was, when I was talking to Shirley, um, as you we were kind of thinking a bit about this, um, Shirley has got extensive experience of helping companies understand what happens when the world falls apart in a different way. And we were dealing with what we thought was a really big issue with Brexit um, and, and, and the world falling apart uh, in that context. Um, and I know that uh, Shirley has spent a lot of time up and down the, the, the length and breadth of the country talking to and advising uh, companies on what to do to deal with the disruption of Brexit, which, which um, sad to say, is the best preparation you could have for a global pandemic. Who knew, right? But, but it's... it's um, so, uh, and Shirley is insightful and pragmatic and practical and it's going to bring us through some kind of practical things that we should do to address the situation. So, so over to you, Shirley. Thank you, Donal, and thank you, Ingrid. Um, as Ingrid would have been discussing with you, she has a five-step approach to managing your supply base. Um, and as I'm with the Brexit program, I would help companies to apply those practical steps. What can you do? Where is your starting point? So uh, in summary of what Ingrid was discussing, from your business perspective, start by looking at your data. What is your historical information? What is the financial information and where is it stored? Identify your top spend suppliers and the suppliers that pose a risk to your business if they can't continue to supply you. So as Ingrid said, on the axis of project matrix, you look at the value and you look at the risk and you'll define your top 10 or top five suppliers. It's also really important to focus on any single sources of supply. So if you've got one supplier that poses a risk to your business, if they can supply you, that's a risk. That's not just a Brexit risk or a COVID risk, it's a business risk. When you have your defined list, it's important to consider why you're dealing with these suppliers. Is it their cost price? Do they provide you with a quality product? Is it the service they offer? The lead times? Consider the credit terms or the brand. Are they synonymous to a brand that you're also working with? Is location important to you? Are you operating just in time delivery? Um, is this something you'll need to change in the future? So once you have your defined list and you've considered the impacts, if they stopped trading with you tomorrow, what are your next steps? And that takes me to my next slide, which, which would be the communication piece. So you may not be buying from suppliers right now, but it is very important to stay connected with them. Contact these suppliers. Are they still trading? If they are trading, in what capacity are they trading? What are their new ways of working? And how are they changing their strategy? For me, that tells you a lot about a company, how they can change their strategy, how flexible they are, how interested they are in retaining your business. What are they doing to minimize your risk as their customer? And how can they support you right now? Can they offer you extended credit terms? Or do they know what stock you, you are holding that you may not be able to sell right now? Do they have an opportunity to redistribute this stock across Europe uh, to other locations or other countries that may be exiting their lockdown period before Ireland? Um, how can you develop new ways of working together? 
and make your check-in a regular occurrence. Uh, make sure you're working in partnership with them, brainstorm together. Uh, if you speak to five suppliers today, that's potentially five new ideas you might have developed that you wouldn't have thought of on your own. My next slide then um, takes me to establishing new supply lines. So if you have built your risk register and you've identified some risks, you now need to start the contingency planning phase. Uh, what do you need to develop new supply channels? Have you researched the market? How do you start this market research? Consider tools like Portis Five Forces and the Pestle Analysis. They will help you evaluate and assess the market. They'll give you a full view um, externally and with your data internally, you'll be, begin to build a better picture and plan. Um, how would you condition these new suppliers? Where, where would you start? What do you need to consider? Um, Ingrid men mentioned the ISO accreditation. Um, does your industry, industry require some certifications or standards that are a must um, for your new supplier? Do you know the technical specification of your products? Uh, would you need to identify the technical specification of the potential new products? Um, start to build your request for information template for your new supplier. Um, can you establish a line of credit immediately? Uh, if you can't, do you need to access funding through one of the company funding schemes? Uh, I know the Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland are a funding scheme set up to help SME specifically. Um, you could potentially access cash flow there to help you bridge that gap. Um, will a change impact your brand? Will your customer be happy with a, with a new brand? Do you need to consider your customer in this approach? Uh, will you need to change your sourcing strategy? Will you need to source your products at a more local approach? Um, if so, what will the impact be to your business? Will your cost price increase? And will you be able to pass that cost increase on to your customer? Sometimes the market won't allow you to do that. Um, do you have customer contracts? Are you obligated to, to have a fixed price with your customer? Or can you pass on the increase of the cost price? Are you producing monthly management accounts? Do you know what your break-even fee is? Um, and if you don't know, you need to, how do you find out? How do you start looking at your gross profit um, and measuring the, the change of supplier? My next slide then is not to forget about your key clients. When you have conducted your supply exercise, it's important to reach out to your key clients, advise them of the work you're doing with your suppliers. They may not be in a position to buy from you, but you can certainly listen to them. You can find out if you can help in any way. Are you holding um, stock that they may be able to forward buy? Uh, what are their plans? How are their strategies changing? Uh, how can you help with these new ways of working? You are the link between your supplier and your customer. So it's important that you tighten that value chain and you work together to, to design your new ways of working. If you're a retail operation, you might be able to reach out to your customers directly. Uh, so you, you may need to work through social media. Um, you may need to increase your online presence. Um, so these are all things that you can consider now that you have a little bit more time on your hands potentially to plan. My next slide then um, is exactly that. Look internally to your business operation. Most SMEs that I work with are very busy with operational activities. So now is the time to look at your business from a holistic perspective. Um, what can you do to improve your business? What are those jobs that you've never had time to address? Um, are your marketing capabilities up to scratch? Can you upskill in this area? Uh, are you currently trading online? Is your e-commerce platform fit for purpose? Or could you avail of the grants and supports out there to maybe make that e-learning e or that e-commerce platform uh, more robust? It's time now to enhance your business as best you can and um, future-proof your business, regardless of Brexit or COVID-19 or whatever the event. Um, I'll leave you with my key takeaway. Uh, act now, analyze your data, reach out to suppliers and customers, tighten all links within your chain, identify risks and opportunities and plan for both, be agile, be flexible in your approach and find new, new and improved ways of working. Thank you. Thank you. That was a maelstrom of magnificence. 
if I can, if I can um, use that. Um, I think, I think, surely the the that felt to me like there's probably twenty or twenty five kind of key things there. So I wouldn't be surprised if people asked us later to kind of say, can we put in our top twenty here very specific actions? Because I thought they were all really. Um, really actionable and things you can kind of go and do and 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 the the incisiveness of each of the things i think will make particular difference for different people for each of the items so i think i, th I think that was i think that was really valuable um and what came to me apart from those specific things that that, that kind of resonated with me as well is the um people like to be asked to help Right, so you talked about go to your suppliers and go to your customers, and 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 I think if people accept the fact that you're doing that in a, a a genuine, authentic, we're trying to help you know solve the problem so that the relationship works best, um, that that seems to be something that I've experienced over the years. Right, people like to help. Right, genuinely, people are fundamentally good, and people like to help. I know that's that's does that does that work for you in terms of folks that you've met in this context? Absolutely. And I feel um, the Irish SME business owner, they're great with the relationship. They're great at networking. Um, so you just have to ask that question. What can I do to help? Or can you help me in this way? What are the steps we can, we can take to work together? Um, we're all working in the same industry. So how can we put some initiatives in place that are going, going to be for the benefit of both you and my business? Yeah. Thank you. And by the way, folks, again, just a reminder, if there's specific questions you want us to address, we've got a couple in. So if you, uh, towards the end, please put them in the, the Q&A box. Um, thanks, Shirley. Um, so I've known Brian O'Kane for, I think it's probably Brian, we did our first book together around 2003, 2004. Something like that, yes. Um, and... Um, Brian is editor supremo and publisher and a gentleman and 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 when Ingrid told me she divided Brian, I'm going, you're stealing my friends now, right? But but um, so um, uh, I've I've had the advantage, as I say, of working with Brian for what's that, seventeen ish years. God help us, and and has helped us had some success with some of the books that we've done together. So that's been great. Um, but along the way, also. Um, I, I didn't need a briefing from Ingrid or from, or from Brian on this because I've worked with Brian, but um, insightfulness of what goes on with small business, I think is something that kind of comes really naturally to Brian. Um, so with that, Mr. O'Kane, sir, I'm going to let you share your wisdom with the world. Okay, thank you, Donald. Um, just to thank both Donald and Ingrid, as you can see, they're vying for the competition to take over my managing my PR. So. Um, I'm still not sure who's going to get the job, but, but there's a job there going. Um, we, we live in very strange times, um, um, and it's really only in the last four or five weeks that this has all changed, our worlds have changed completely, and, and how we respond to it is going to determine our future of our businesses and ourselves and our families. Um, the title we have for this bit of, of the, the webinar, Adjusting the New Normal, um, in the last 24 hours, I've become increasingly unhappy with that word adjusting. Adjusting sounds very comfortable, sounds very easy. It sounds like a, a gentle nudge rather than the hammer blow that has probably hit lots of businesses, uh, including many of yours. Um, so I think this is where we, we need to look at um, thinking ahead and, and how we begin to do things in the future. Um, in a world that has changed utterly in the short term, and we don't know yet when that short term is going to end. So let's look at the first slide, the first point that I want to make of four. Um, I want to talk four things, um, and the first is something that's fairly short term. Um, the middle two are going to be slightly longer term or near term, um, and then there's one longer term one which is going to take a while to implement. Um, as Donald said, I, I'm an editor. Um, I trained as an accountant, but I moved into publishing and editing back in 1994. So I'm a long time doing this. 
and, and the choice of words is really quite important to me. So initially, um, this heading was, hug, was talk to your customers. Um, and I changed it yesterday afternoon to hug your customers because I think that's the kind of response that people need. Um, everybody is hurting. You're hurting. I'm hurting. Other people are hurting. Um, and we're doing it alone because we can't get close to each other. Um, we can't get physically close to each other unless we live in the same household. Um, one of the, the most heartbreaking things um, of the last four or five weeks has been to watch um, situations where people are dying in intensive care um, and they haven't seen their families. Um, they can't, their families can't be with them at their bedsides. Um, to see funerals where many of the people who would naturally be there, the closest family members, cannot be there themselves because they are self-isolating. To see the way that the big Irish funeral where everybody who path had ever crossed with the person who had died comes to the church, comes to the house, is there for the, for the, the funeral itself, uh, that's all gone by the wayside. One of our neighbours died last week. Um, we didn't know him particularly well, but we would still have gone to the removal, possibly gone to the mass um, the next morning. Um, there was no mass except for a handful of people. And so our neighbours, through a WhatsApp group that we had organised, um, came together and we came onto the road uh, where the, the funeral cortege, cortege being the hearse and one other car um, passed by and everybody stood outside their houses as a mark of respect. Uh, and that was all we could do. We couldn't get any closer. We couldn't hug the people and we couldn't do anything for them in the way that we would have been used to doing. And, and your customers and your suppliers are hurting in exactly the same way. So hug is not too strong a word. Back to Donald's point about the genuineness that you need to show to your customers. This is not just being nice. I think being nice in business does pay. I, I've seen examples of a payback for us, um, but it's not just about being nice. There is a solid business reason for doing this as well. Um, Forbes magazine recently released a survey which showed that of the companies that did best after the 2008 crash, those were the companies that were best at the customer experience, at customer service, at looking after their customers before the crash. When you are frightened, when things are changing, you go back to what's comfortable, to what you know, where people like you, look after you, um, and that's where you find companies with really good customer service. You put up with poor customer service um, because it's cheap, because it's efficient, because it's there. Um, but you won't, when things are difficult, you will go back to somewhere where people recognize you and respect you and, and go that extra mile for you. The purpose of talking to customers is, from a business point of view, is around keeping the business you've got and getting more business. I'm very struck by um, Bob Johnson of the Gutter Bookshop. Um, some of you who live in Dublin may know it. It's there at the end of Cows Lane and there's another little shop out in Dorky in recent years as well. Um, Bob has built a small little independent book, bookshop in, in a world which is moving away from printed books um, to the point where through his social media presence and the relationship he has with customers, um, once the lockdown came, he was able to take um, online orders for his customers from a website that was barely functional in terms of online sales um, and was quickly revamped to, to do that um, to the point where he was four or five or six days behind in, in servicing those orders. Um, eventually had to close because he wasn't allowed in, in to work um, and is now back at work since yesterday trying to plow through these orders. But even when he was closed and, and daily said on social media and on their website, they said that they could not take, they could not process orders or release them until such time as the lockdown was over, people kept placing the orders. They wanted to support the business to make sure that they stayed in business and that they had enough money to keep going. And beyond that extra business, um, he was also clearing out existing stock in many cases because what you saw on the website was what he had in stock. Um, so there was a double benefit there. 
I think one of the things in, in talking to your customers, and, and it has to be, as Donald said, not a selling exercise. Um, this has to be genuinely going to see, you know, how are you? How are you feeling? How are your staff? Um, what are your problems and pains now? And is there anything we can do? Um, and it's finding out from that, but it's understanding those customers. Um, we've all seen over the last couple of weeks the, the huge efforts that have been made around companies repurposing their equipment and their factories to make ventilators, to make face masks, to make gowns, to make all sorts of things. Um, Zara, Prada, Ralph Lauren are all converting factories to make gowns. So some lucky or unfortunate healthcare worker is going to end up in a Prada gown um, that they would never have been able to afford otherwise. Um, it's an unintended, perhaps, bonus out of the, the whole thing. But other bits are happening. Rolls-Royce has dedicated its fleet of, of courtesy cars, 43 cars, to delivering um, groceries and helping vulnerable people in the community in which their factories are based. Um, there's a great example today on, on, online of a company called Clear, um, Class Pass, um, which provides um, a support for trainers in an online environment. And trainers, personal trainers in gyms with gyms clothes have found it really difficult. Some are geared up to do online videos and live stream. Most have no clue how to do that. Um, and ClassPass has, has moved to a point where they have launched a part of a feature on an app and that allows trainers to video themselves, to send these out to, as live stream to their, their customers, um, and they've made it available free. So any revenues that the trainer gets from those videos comes direct to the trainer. It's not shared with ClassPass. In, in that instance, um, when this is all over and the, the customer, the trainer is looking to renew their subscription with some service, ClassPass is going to be way up there at the top of that list. So there is a bit of malice of forethought, as my father would have said, um, but it, it comes from a genuine intention to serve and to, and to help. One last little picky thing, which nobody has mentioned today, um, and it's in that context of being close to your customers. Have you actually told your customers on your website um, or in your social media what you are doing? The numbers of websites I've been on looking to buy something online and it's only when you get in to the actual product and you click on the buy now button that you discover that it's not available, it's out of stock or it's not, uh, we can't do home delivery at this point in time. That's something that should be on the front of the website so people know instantly whether they can or cannot order from you. Okay, if it's a negative, we can't supply you. That's not something you perhaps want to shout too loudly from the rooftops. Um, but there must be some way that you can get to customers or to encourage them to come back to or place the order and we'll deal with it as fast as we can. And if you are open, then definitely you want to be telling people so we don't move off to somewhere else um, looking for the product that you have available. My second point, moving to the nearer term, is to take this time as a kind of reset and to look at knowing what you know now, would you do it like this again? Your customers have gone quiet, as for many of you they have. They haven't got, you haven't got businesses out there trading and busy at the moment. And um, this is a time to look at it and to see what can you do? Um, about two years ago, Ingrid asked me to do a session for a course she was running in UCC um, on innovation and procurement. And, and one of the little pieces I put in there as an icebreaker was an exercise I came across from an American trainer, um, and it's called Kill a Stupid Rule. We asked people, we gave them five minutes to think about their, the businesses they worked in as employees in most cases, um, and to identify a rule that they'd love to go back to the office the next day and to get permission to do away with. Several people having been asked to produce one rule, a stupid rule, produced A4 pages full of rules. Um, look at your own business. What are the stupid things you do? How can you streamline your systems? Can you automate? Can you rethink what it is you do? This is a time for, for innovation. 
innovation always happens outside your comfort zone, outside our comfort zone. It, that's probably the reason why it doesn't happen in good times. It's why it doesn't happen for most businesses because it is just too comfortable. When life is good, why do you want to make changes? Life isn't good now and life is fairly rough. Life is fairly dangerous just right now. This is the time when you can begin to do something and make changes and make very, very big changes. So knowing what you know now about your business, what does recovery look like for your business? Is it business as usual, which I'm not sure is going to happen or not have, certainly not happen very soon, or is it something else? Which takes us to the next point. Normal has just been cancelled. Um, there's a graffiti going around apparently at the moment, um, which says there can be no return to normal because normal was the problem in the first place. So if normal is cancelled, what do we do? Because normal depends on us going back to where we were before, if that's our definition of normal, and it probably is for most of us. And the reality is that social distancing, which is being extended in two week and three week tranches is likely to continue for some of us and maybe all of us for a lot longer than we think, um, certainly beyond the beginning of May. Um, it's likely to be re return again later if there's a second or a third wave or as clusters of virus pop up in different places. And despite the notions of herd immunity, immunity um, the reality is that we will not get to that safe space where we can walk and go back to normal lives until we get a vaccine. And there are something like 170 research groups working around the world at the moment on a new vaccine. Um, and there's some very promising trials starting, moving very quickly, much more quickly than normal um, towards human trials. But the reality is that mass scale vaccination will not happen until the middle of next year. And until you and I can go out safely into the world and interact with our customers face to face and shake their hands, um, then we are not going to be able to, to do business in the way we've considered to be normal. So what does not normal look like? Um, again, Ingrid mentioned it in terms of dependence on foreign suppliers. And, for, and long supply chains coming from far away. Um, yes, it makes a huge amount of sense from a business point of view, um, but I think we're going to see a change. Um, people are going to look at manufacturing and making and assembling much, much closer to home. Um, maybe not for everything, but Enterprise Ireland's original mandate of import substitution is suddenly going to take on new legs in a way that has never really gripped people before. What happens to a world where there's reduced travel? I, I know this happened after 9-11. Everybody said we'll do video conferencing and within a couple of years it went back again. But maybe this time around it might change. I've just read a business plan this morning from a lady who um, has done a lot of very, very good market research. Her customers are in the States. And by digging deep into the data, she's managed to find that 143,000 of her target market visited Ireland last year. Now, the target market is not in the tourism, but these are people who came and could be exposed to her particular products in the tourist outlets. How many of those are going to come from the States this year or next year? Staffing. We've seen over the years, the last number of years, we've seen a move towards very lean businesses. Um, companies like yours and mine have been reluctant to take on staff where you can squeeze a little bit more. Um, we've seen a move towards the gig economy where people work um, zero hours, where they're, they get paid by the job they do um, rather than on a, a fixed salary. And that's fine. Um, there has already been a little bit of a kickback uh, on that, but it's going to have a major impact 
um, I think, a major pushback in the next um, year or two, um, because people are going to realize just how insecure they already have realized, but as a society, we need to decide, is it right to let people be that, that insecure? Even working from home, which has been seen as a panacea and, and everybody, including government departments, has moved, have moved towards this idea of working from home where you can. Um, how many of those people will want to stay working from home in the future? And what about the health and safety implications of it? Just right now, nobody's taking any notes of it. Um, people are using kitchen chairs and, and kitchen tables are, are working in their dining rooms. But I know from bitter experience that dining room chairs are not designed for long-term use. What happens to the kids who wander in in the, in the back of a, of a Zoom call like this? It's, it's all very charming just right now. Um, it's our first insight to people's private lives. Um, and it looks uh, a little bit fun. And there's even a company in, the, in California, um, where else, um, called Sweet Farm, which will provide a, an opportunity for you to use one of their llamas or pet goats to pop in in the middle of your Zoom call um, and create a little bit of a disturbance. And, and this is all very charming and tree and, and very nice uh, and acceptable just right now. But if the new normal becomes Zoom calls, will it then be acceptable Will it then be considered professional to have kids wandering in and out looking for daddy's attention? Um, what about taxes? Um, we haven't thought about what's going to happen, who's going to pay for all of this. Um, Ireland and the UK have been immensely generous um, to people who have, through no fault of their own, um, been laid off or put on short term or furloughed, as they call it, um, and, and rightly so. And that's the kind of society that, that I want to live in. But somewhere down the line, we're going to have to pay back this money. And the only people who can pay it back are you and me, the taxpayers. So where are the taxes going to fall? And what effect that, is that going to have on your business? This is about opportunity, I suppose. Um, whether you see it or whether you don't see it. Um, the glass, whether it's half full or half empty, is mathematically contains the exact same amount of, of liquid, um, but it's a matter of how you perceive it. And some people will perceive now and the future as a threat, um, and others are going to see opportunity and are moving forward from that. Okay, uh, last point, um, which is about looking at the longer term future. Don't let this happen to you again. Um, if you look online or talk to consultants or banks or accountants at the moment, um, they will talk to you about business continuity plans. Ingrid mentioned it. And they're very important. Um, and the, the Department of Business uh, Enterprise and Innovation website has a fairly good um, guidance towards building that kind of plan. But there's an old maxim about, the, about this, that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. But you can't build a, a business continuity plan. If you look down through what the steps are involved in doing so, you can't do it now for it to have impact. You can only plan for the next disaster, for the next problem. And the reason I say don't let this happen to you again is that in our business, a book publishing business, largely book publishing at that point, um, in 2008, um, our business fell off a cliff. Went like that. And we could date it to August, September, end of August 2008, it went like that. Sales of printed books disappeared um, because our customers lost their jobs um, and they suddenly found much more pressing priorities to spend their money on and then on their own education. Okay, disaster. Worse than that was the fact that at the time we owed over 100,000 euros to our printer for books that we had not yet sold. Our printer was extremely good, really, really good. They allowed us to work it through and pay that money back over several years and we were able to do it. But the one resolve that we made at that point was that we would never let this happen to us again. We would never find ourselves so exposed that we could have lost our business 
and much worse than losing our business, we could have lost our house too. Now is the time to make that decision, not to put it into practice because it's too late to do that now, um, but to start thinking about how you work from that. Our first change was to move to print on demand. Instead of printing 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 copies of a book, because that was the economically sensible thing to do and got us the lowest unit price, and we moved to print on demand. Our unit cost is higher, but our stock is lower. Somewhere back before 2008, I can't remember the exact date, but it was probably several years before that. Um, but 20 years ago, we would have had 300,000 euros worth of stock books that we had printed, um, in some cases paid for, um, which had yet to sell. Our current stock is just over 10,000 euros at the end of December last year. Look at the physical mobility of your business. Like lots of other businesses in Cork, we suffered from a flood in 2011. Um, I remember the day vividly because it was the day we delivered or got delivery of a four and a half thousand euro A3 color laser printer that I've been saving up for, for, for several months beforehand. The guys weren't supposed to come till the Monday, but they rang on Thursday afternoon about four o'clock and said, it's in, do you want it? Or will we wait till Monday? And I said, no, bring it on. They came a half an hour later, installed the printer and as they were going out they realized that the flood had suddenly had come and would come up our street had never done it before um, and looked like it was coming in all i could think of leaving the office as i had to wade ankle deep in the water was we have just bought a four and a half thousand euro laser printer and it's not insured luckily the flood went away um, the laser printer wasn't damaged um, but we had six to seven weeks of utter disruption because it was river water, it was dirty. We had to take everything, starting with the carpets and upwards and lift everything out. Um, and in the context of all of that, the claims assessor said to me, we might like to look at our business continuity cover. Um, I thought about it for a little while um, and then realized, and I was proved right later, two Christmases later, um, when we ended up with um, a burst frozen water pipe, um, which sprayed down through the business again. Um, we could move the entire business out of the office in about 20 minutes, um, move it all home. We needed to rescue my laptop, one other computer, a printer, um, make sure we had an internet connection and we moved, diverted the landline across to one of the mobile phones and we could be in business again in an hour's time. Um, that physical mobility gives you resilience. We, we made a decision as well that we would not owe money to anybody. So over the next number of years, we paid off our bank loans. We paid down our creditors. As of yesterday evening, and I checked, um, we have virtually no creditors. We certainly have no trade creditors. We have nobody who could, if they cut us off, would cause us problems with our ongoing business. We have built a cash buffer. We could eliminate a number of direct debits, which I regard as being essential now, but might not be essential in three months time. Um, and our target has been to get to the point where we have 12 months cash to allow the business to hold together on an ongoing basis. It dips at certain times of the year, particularly now as we're paying out royalties from pre last year, um, but that's our target and we try to keep to that. That gives us a lot of strength. Now, it's not been easy to do. It's taken us a long time, probably seven or eight years from the immediate get back and pay off the printer bill um, to get to this point. It's only in the last three years or so that we've been comfortable enough to have got to that stage. The consequences are that we have changed our business. Um, it's, we have sacrificed growth and we probably sacrificed profitability as well coming from that growth. Um, but we now have a business that for the last five or six weeks, as this crisis has unfolded and got worse day by day, as the deaths have mounted, I have not lost a night's sleep. Big change from 2008. I've been very lucky, um, but it's something that you can do, not for now, but for next, next time round. Um, it's taking you back initially to points two and three, knowing what you know now, how would you change your business? What happens if 
the business that you would like to run, the normal business is cancelled and you have to do something else. And where do you want to be the next time something like this happens? Um, this is not a comfortable place to be. This has not been fun over the last number of weeks. Um, it's not going to get any funnier, uh, any more comfortable, um, but we need to ride it out uh, and to work our way through. Um, good luck, everybody. See you on the other side um, and hope this has been helpful to you. Thanks, Brian. Um, there's a lot in there and I'm and, and not surprised to get the authenticity and the, and the, and the, the, the true stories that were in it. Um, we have a few kind of parting thoughts to deliver um, and, uh, and then some Q&A. Uh, Ingrid, if you want to come back in, we have about 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask you to do your parting thoughts in a few minutes and then we'll do, we've we got a couple of questions in that we'll try and deal with um, if we can do. Yeah, I'll be very quick. One one uh, quote came to mind when I was listening to to Brian was a quote of John F. Kennedy: "The best time to fix your roof is when it's not raining." And we're all talking about contingency plans and continuity. We're, it's raining at the moment, so absolutely, what can we do better for next time? Um, just parting thoughts, bringing it all back together. My first um, slide is actually telling you to focus on what you want to do. As Brian outlined, you now have time to think and rethink your future. Be brave. Um, the world will be different. Customers might be different, might want different things. Your business will be different. Don shared with us that your perspective is key and your authenticity will make the difference and you're dealing with all the links in your supply chain. Uh, furthermore, make visible what you can control. Incredible change happens in your life when you decide to take control of what you do have power over instead of craving control what you can't. Let's all think back of what we can control and strengthen that because we can control what happens outside of our remit. Collaborate together and take control by piecing your puzzle together. Map your steps towards your goal. And your goal is to create a, a resilient business, I'm sure. There is no map. Charting a path ahead will not be easy. It never has. Any entrepreneur will know that. But um, it will be even harder. We'll need to invent, reinvent, which means we will need to experiment as well. Some things will be successful. Others won't. But Take ownership of your own future. Lose, like Brian said, lose a few rules today. Create ideas instead and think them through. Um, prior, prioritize what matters. And again, a little quote from Mahatma Gandhi said, action expresses priorities. It's all in the doing. Most of us spend too much time on what is urgent and not enough time on what is important. We need to now refocus and rethink what is important to us. Success comes, um, it comes down to your attitude. It comes down to commitment. It comes down to your focus. It is actually walking, and, and Winston Churchill would have said this, it's walking from one failure into another without losing your enthusiasm. So please don't lose your enthusiasm. And we would be delighted to be in a few months time be part of another webinar when where you all come to us and tell us what you have done what you have achieved how you have changed to to continue your business ultimately it's just again be ready for takeoff that first steps that, uh, towards getting somewhere is to decide that you're not going to stay where you are now so Somebody once told me strategy apps are is deciding what not to do. Um, so decide what you want to do and go for it. No matter how hard the past is, you can always start again. And opportunities don't just happen, you create them. So um, finally, good things come to people who wait, but better things come to people who go out and get them. So with that, go out and get them. Thank you. Dono, Thanks, for your MC. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, a lot of just 
tremendous content through the the, the whole uh, two hours. Um, and there's a few, I guess, interesting observations and questions have come in. Just to comment on one of the things, Ingrid, that 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 you said, which is the um, uh, pick priorities. When the word priority was first used, it didn't have a plural. Priority was one word. You know, it was a singular. It was one thing you should do. And I think, I think that that's 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 possibly worth um, worth thinking about. Um, as you kind of go through this, there's a few questions. So we can bring back in Brian and Shirley as well, please. Um, first question came in and uh, it was, is now, and Ingrid, you, you can stay with us as well, right? Is now the best time ever to start planning to start a new business? Um, I think that question came in from the early stage when I was doing the, the, the piece. Um, and, Customer problems never go away, in my opinion. Right, customers always have problems, um, and I think the only time you should start a new business is when you identify an urgent problem you can solve for a customer, and 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 a problem that's going to exist, and a problem that's going to exist in in a sufficient quantity to help you build the business to the size you want to build it. So. It's kind of a complex question, in my opinion. What's the best ever time to start planning to start a business? Right? Do you want to build? It depends on what you want to build a business for. I think uh, times that are tough are great opportunities. People have lots of problems. They're looking for people to help. And I think if you have uh, identified an urgent problem and you're prepared to make the commitment and make the sacrifice and stay the course and take your responsibilities, then I think it's a fantastic time. I've done that. Um, uh, a number of different times. So, um, so as we, um, I'm going to move on to that. Just that there's some questions that relate to uh, supply chain, and I'm going to give this one to Ingrid. Uh, what do you think will happen with the global supply chain in the next five years, and how will Ireland's approach change? Well, obviously, uh, an immediate reaction across the globe would be bring back, bring back our manufacturer closer to us. Um, uh, will it happen? Uh, there will be business cases um, that will be made for it. What I would say to that is whatever the decision will be, it is always good. It is always a good business decision to have a local uh, contingency supplier of products or services irrespective of their competitiveness on cost as long as they can deliver to your customer a similar um, quality and a value proposition that you want to uh, have associated with your uh, business then a local source either European better uh, Ireland where you won't have the complexity of, of the, 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 the distance, where you, it, it's a lot more in your control, would be, would be just a, a good thing to do. So single source is a huge risk. Single source across the world is even a, 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 a bigger risk, I would say, at a minimum dual source, multi-source, and bring your second and third sure, um, yeah. preferred supplier closer together. Make sure you have a backup plan. Assume something's going to break and be ready to kind of take care of it. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Shirley. Um, so, um, so if you can unmute yourself, please. Um, so do you have an opinion? I think this is a really tough question. Right? So happy to share it with you, Shirley. Thank you, the knock-on effect of Brexit and the pandemic together. So the question is, uh, what are some key impacts that we can impact, that, that we can expect as a knock-on effect on our manufacturing in Ireland? So let's lead with Brexit and, and, and then if anyone can add on pandemic. Can you ask the question again there, sir? What, what are some of the key impacts of Brexit uh, on manufacturing in Ireland? Shirley Ingrid. Um, well, from a manufacturing point of view, again, it has to. It, I I have seen um, SMEs actually strengthening their manufacturing here, um, and uh, thinking actually 
rather than our first port, port, uh, port of call would have been UK. Now um, staying into the Eurozone rather than uh, dealing with um, our sterling um, um, cousins. So it, from a manufacturing point of view, I, I do believe Ireland is a very competitive environment from, for, for manufacturers. I wouldn't see too much of a change unless the demand is going to change globally. But we have, in, in, a, in, a, in a small country, we have an amazing manufacturing um, mix of, of really big organizations. I don't believe that's going to change fast. What might change is that um, we will move our, our um, extended supply chain actually rather than from the UK, we'll move it into, into European uh, continental uh, suppliers or, or customers. And can I, just, can I just add as well there, just in terms of bottleneck supply, we may see um, some companies bringing, bringing their specification in-house and developing their own solutions. Okay, so um, thank you. And I'm running out of time on this. So it's just a couple of things. Somebody said, is it possible for other listeners to send in what ideas they're putting together for their customers for us to share and build on them? So I'm going to presume, Eilish, that if, um, if we send some stuff together, we can, we can compile it and put it together in some kind of format for folks to access. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll be using the course page for any additional resources that our listeners would like. Um, and also, I think Jimmy <clears throat> is possibly talking about peer-to-peer -peer learning as well. So something myself and Michael are working on, um, which I'll talk about at the end, about how we're going to try and, and, and bring you guys together more, because it is difficult in this format as participants to interact with each other. Um, so we're going to try and, and bring some of that offline as well um, in terms of engagement outside of the webinars. Okay, super. Thanks. Um, so the the I'm going to um, having lost control of my keyboard here. Um, I want to uh, thank everybody. I have a slide here with contact information which I can't find, so um, I'm going to not worry about it. But there'll be contact information which which we can also make available. Um, I'm going to thank everyone for the time. I um, want to be sure that on behalf of everybody who did, who kind of panelists, is thank everyone, uh, make sure everyone stays well, stays healthy, stays calm, and stays at home. All right, so um, I'll give it to you, Eilish, uh, and thanks to the panelists for all the input and people for their questions. Thank you so much, Donald. Um, you. you made my job very, very easy today. Uh, it was great to just sit back and enjoy it. Um, a huge thank you to Ingrid, Donald, Brian and Shirley for those insights. It was really, as I said, I got to sit back and enjoy it today. So it was very, very interesting. Tough to listen to at times, for sure. Um, but I think that, that is the reality of the world that we live in. Um, but I suppose what I took from it more than, the, than the, the, the terrifying aspects of it, or to, if you start thinking about it in too much detail, was the lessons in resilience. Um, and there's two really key themes, I think, that are coming out in all of these webinars, um, and I'm sure it will continue over the next couple of weeks. And that is the theme of relationships, the importance of working with people. We buy from people, we sell to people, and, and that dynamic, uh, Ingrid, I think you spoke to that. All of you spoke to that really, really well. Um, and in perspective, that, that we are starting to look closer to home um, and that it is a beacon of light, I suppose, for many small businesses in Ireland, that people's perspective are changing in terms of how we source things and where, where we are, um, where, where the goods and services we're consuming are coming from. Um, so it was really interesting to hear that emerge again in today's discussion. Uh, so thank you so much to all of the participants, um, to all of our panellists and to our participants. Um, a reminder that tomorrow's webinar um, will start at 10.30 a.m. As usual, you'll get your invitation link in the morning and tomorrow we are looking at the topic of financial management through times of uncertainty and we are joined with a team from PwC and um, so Mark McEnroe with two of his colleagues Laura and Ray as well as Suzanne Bird as lecturer in the Graduate Business School Accounting Lecture um, in Griffith College will be um, steering the ship tomorrow and looking at all things working capital, cash flow management and um, so again a very timely topic I believe. And please also read the email that you get um, with that link tomorrow because it will have the details of our bonus webinar, which has been brought to us kindly 
by Stovey. Um, you can visit stovey.com to see what uh, JP and Connor are all about in terms of data protection, privacy, and compliance. Um, so that's it for today. Um, we, we had the full two hours. It was absolutely jam-packed. Um, definitely a video that you will want to re-watch, I'm sure, because there was a lot of depth in the content covered. So the video will be available up on the course page um, tomorrow. For now, as Donald said, everyone stay safe and well and stay inside, and we will see you all in the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.